Today we are talking about the dangers of Pentecostalism and the doctrines that fail in Pentecostal teaching. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, uh, Paul mentions to ministers what it means to be a good minister. And he says that to be a good minister, or 1 Timothy rather, rather uh, means to bring to remembrance some of these doctrines that people teach that are wrong. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared. Uh, some of the doctrines he lists were forbidding to marry, abstaining from meats, and all of this. And uh, verse 6, he says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine. So he's admonishing Timothy uh, to bring people into remembrance of some of these doctrines that are not right, that were popular at the time. Okay, One part of being a minister and educating and edifying each other in the body of Christ is not to avoid uh, the doctrine that is incorrect, but rather to bring it to light. Uh, that's what creates discernment in the mind of an intelligent, thinking Christian. Okay, You're able to see what people believe, where they're coming from, even the Bible verses they use, and you're able to discern why it's right or not right based on the Scripture, not based on your opinion, not based on how you feel, but based on the Scripture. And so when you bring these things to remembrance, as Timothy is supposed to do here, uh, that he's supposed to teach them the dispensational setting and where they, they belong in the Scripture. Uh, if you notice in the passage there, I can go on and talk about how the doctrines of devils in the passage is abstaining from meats. And yet God gave that doctrine in the Old Testament to abstain from meats. But here, Paul calls it a doctrine of devils. And that's because that's not going on today. You're not under the law. Okay, and so why would you put someone back under the law when you're not under it? So the, it's necessary for us to understand the Bible, but not just the Bible, the Bible rightly divided, the context of the verses so we can explain it. And that's what we're getting into when we talk about Pentecostalism, because uh, Pentecostals as a group, as a whole, and again, uh, I'm making some generalizations here because we all know there's varying degrees of interest and involvement in any church group and all of that, uh, whether they're saved or not. But Pentecostals as a whole are a little more biblically oriented than some other groups. They'll open your Bible and quote you Acts chapter 2, and they know some of the verses, and, and that's one of their evangelistical points is we obey all the Bible, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. You know, and they'll add that on. We have the full gospel, right? And so they know some verses, and so the only way to understand where they're coming from and to help them understand the Bible uh, more perfectly is to know some verses also, to know their verses and to know what, what's right and wrong. Okay, and so I come to you presenting some verses today to help you be better equipped to handle some of these situations. Okay, uh, Pentecostals, uh, Pentecostalism is the largest Christian denomination, excluding Catholics, if you count them as Christian which, of course, they're not, you know, but uh, it, it's questionable whether a lot of these people are saved or not. But there are 500 plus million Pentecostals in the world, okay, and they're the largest Protestant denomination and the fastest growing. Uh, it was another report came out this last week that the Southern Baptists are on the decline, you know. And for a long while, the Southern Baptists and the Methodists were the largest denominations. And yet they're kind of falling by the wayside slowly and slowly, and the Pentecostals and the charismatic thinking is becoming more pervasive. And so today we'll talk specifically about the basics of Pentecostal teaching, which is different than charismaticism, if you can understand the difference. Charismaticism is the belief in the supernatural powers. And that thinking not only exists in Pentecostalism, but also in other denominations, like some Baptists and Methodists and Catholics. They'll also adhere to the supernatural powers for today, and that's a charismatic belief. So you can see where Pentecostals and the 500 million who claim to be Pentecostals that's not just excluded to them with supernatural powers. There's a lot more than 500 million that claim the supernatural powers. Uh, but Pentecostals are, are typically the ones that are labeled with, you know, they're the ones that all, are all about these supernatural powers and the ones that uh, make that their definitive doctrine. Uh, Pentecostals become the pinata of Christianity. Okay, everybody hits on them. That's how it works. Uh, you, you get people who are not Pentecostal. And they hit on the Pentecostals. I mean, look at the televangelists on TV. They're all Pentecostal. Okay, and how easy is it for people to, to mock and to shame them? Uh, asking for money for just silly things and, uh, you know, selling prayer cloths and this sort of thing. And uh, some of the things that they do are just outrageous, you know. Uh, besides that, the non-Christians see right through this also. 
And so uh, even Muslims and other religions, when they think of Christianity because of the pervasiveness of Pentecostalism, they think of Pentecostal teachers. You know, so they, they think of all of the, the, the healing and the miracles and the faith healers and, and the charismaticism that goes along with it, and they make that Christianity. And so if you understand uh, logic and how that works, they set up that as Christianity, knock it down, and then say, see, all Christianity is bogus. Okay, well, that's what makes us a little bit different, is we're not following a crowd, we're not following a statement of faith, but we're following the Bible, and the Bible rightly divided. And if that's Christianity, by the way, I, I would agree with the atheist and, and the others who would hit on the Pentecostals. I mean, if that's all Christianity is, uh, we're, 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 we don't got much, okay? But the good news is that there is more than that. Uh, and it comes from the, from Paul's gospel and from, from his epistles. And so... Um, that's what we're diving into today. And I titled the message The Dangers of Pentecostalism just because uh, in order to be a Pentecostal and adhere to some of the beliefs that they do, which we'll cover, you have to reject the special revelation given to Paul. Uh, you cannot think that a special message was given to Paul and be a Pentecostal. They've defined themselves on Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Okay? And, of course, we understand the special revelation was given to Paul later in Acts chapter 9. Okay, and so if that's where you draw a line, Pentecost isn't in that section there, see? So that, that's, their, that's their problem when they come to the table. And so it's going to be hard uh, for them when you talk to them about Paul's gospel because y you're attacking the root of their belief system. Uh, they, they start reading the Bible in Acts chapter 2, okay? And you're going, no, we need to move that over a little bit. You know, um, so it's going to be tough. So at the beginning here, I want to define what Pentecostalism is. And just in case we don't know, I want to get on the table. And I'm, I'm not wanting to uh, m speak much today about the, the, all of the behaviors that are surrounded by Pentecostalism, but the doctrines themselves, okay, so that we're equipped with the Bible verses. Next week, we'll deal more with some of the behaviors and the experiences and that sort of thing that, that they claim to have. And so what I want to start out with is drawing a little chart here about where they begin. Now, modern Christianity, unfortunately, decides what church to go to, not based on the Bible, which is a sad thing. Okay? They decide what church to go to or what group to, to study with based on uh, the people in the church, okay? uh, the power that the church claims to have, and the praise band. Okay? And that's basically how they do it. Um, they, if they like the people, they'll go. You know? If the church seems you know, to have the power of God in it, then they'll go. If the church has a good praise band, they'll go. You know, these are, the, these are the criteria by which people determine which church to go to. And so that right there, when you say, well, what do they teach? They're thinking, well, that's kind of a weird thing to ask. You know, what does it really matter? Don't we all teach the same thing? You know, they all kind of think that everyone teaches the same, and yet they don't. And so uh, when you come to Pentecostalism, you have to understand that people open the Bible and start reading it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's when Christ came to the planet. Okay, so Christianity has Christ in the name. Christ didn't begin until Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's where we start, right? Well, the Pentecostals, they got a new revelation, right? Because it's not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now we're in the book of Acts. And so when Christ comes and he dies on the cross, most of Christianity is back here working in his earthly ministry. And we talked about that last week, remember, with the dispensational chart. Well, he died and he resurrected. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven, and this is... Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. And the Pentecostals say this is the new information right here, the Holy Spirit coming down in Acts chapter 2. Okay, this is above and beyond Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so they plant down right here and say this is where the church begins. This is where our doctrine is to be taken. This is the example by which we are to model our Christianity. Okay, in Acts chapter 2. Uh, so uh, we see a problem initially because in Pentecost, which we'll see here in a second, uh, the 12 apostles we're heading into the kingdom. We covered that last week, which is the same message that Jesus had in his earthly ministry. And they preached the gospel of the kingdom up until Acts chapter 7. We can call this the chart of the Acts. In Acts chapter 7, you get a man named Stephen filled with the Holy Spirit, because that's what came down in Acts 2. And he's got the face of an angel. And he's in front of the Jewish rulers, the religious leaders, and he claims that uh, they're stiff-necked and hard-hearted and are rejecting the message the Holy Spirit has given them to the people. And in rejection of the Messiah, uh, Stephen looks up and sees uh, heavens open and Jesus Christ is standing there ready to return. 
And uh, they, they call that blasphemy, and they stone him to death. Okay, and there was a man consenting unto his death by the name of Saul. And so he saw the death of Stephen and was there holding his clothes. He's consenting to it. He gave the thumbs up, stoned this guy, he's a blasphemer. And from then on, Saul in chapters 8 and uh, chapters 9 persecuted this church right here. Okay, but we also know what happened. Christ returns to Paul in Acts chapter 9 and saves him by his grace which is unprecedented, and tells him, I'm going to make you an apostle to the Gentiles. Right? I'm going to give you some information. And Galatians chapter 1 tells us that for three years he studied under the Lord Jesus Christ about this new information. And after he did that, he didn't go back to Jerusalem or Israel. He went out to Gentile nations and started teaching them. And it wasn't 15 years before he went to Jerusalem, after he started teaching. So that's what happens in Acts chapter 9. And this is where we stand, by the way, in the middle of the book of Acts. Right? This is where we take our model, and this is our, the beginning of what we're doing right here. So you see the difference. right? So Paul, starting in Acts chapter 9, begins a new message. In the rest of the book of Acts, you get a decline of the nation Israel. And you get a decline because something new has started. Israel has rejected the Messiah, they've rejected the Old Testament prophets, and they've rejected the Holy Spirit. Once they've rejected the Holy Spirit, remember in Matthew what the uh, punishment was for blaspheming the Holy Spirit? No more forgiveness. You're done. Okay? And so Christ comes back instead of pouring out his wrath and reveals his grace to Paul. And Israel as a program, Israel as a nation, the whole prophetic system back here, going to the kingdom, was on the decline. Instead of them going into the kingdom, now farther and farther away from it. And so Paul, all through the book of Acts here, goes into synagogues. Okay, he'll go to synagogue here and a synagogue there. And he preaches to them Jesus being the Christ. And saying, you better get on board. And you better get saved by the cross and all this because this is your last chance. And everywhere he goes, the Jews reject him. The book of Acts is about the apostles. That's Acts of the Apostles. But it's about Israel rejecting the gospel. They reject it in Acts 1. They reject it in Acts 2. All through the book, they reject it. It's about Israel rejecting the gospels. Okay? If you want to learn about the Gentiles receiving it, Read Galatians and Ephesians and 1 Corinthians, all those Gentile books there where Paul's preaching to people who've received the gospel. And he tells the Corinthians, you are my crown and glory. Okay, So that's where you read about that stuff. But all through the book of Acts, you'll see Paul going to synagogues and he gets stoned, he gets thrown out, you know, uh, and he gets mocked and all of this. So by the time that Acts 13 comes around, when Paul makes his first trip, makes his first journey, he goes to Corinth and he goes into a synagogue there and the Jews kick him out. Okay, and the Gentiles receive him. And so what he says to the Jews here in Corinth is that uh, it's necessary that we came unto you first. In fact, let's look at Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. And he's speaking to Jews here in verse 45. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So in Acts 13, Paul says we're turning to the Gentiles. He goes on in his missionary journeys to preach to, to uh, people in Antioch. I'm sorry, I had this backwards. 13, chapter 13 is, are the people in Antioch and Pisidia. Acts chapter 18, he goes to Corinth. Acts chapter 18, verse... Six. It says, when they opposed themselves, meaning the Jews in verse 5, because they, pressed, they were pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. That's Paul, Acts 18.6. So he's preaching to the Jews in the synagogue again. They, tell, they cry blasphemy against him. So he says, that's it. You know, my blood's clean. I, I told you the gospel. I'm out of here. I'm going to the Gentiles. In Acts 18, he says, I will go. There we go. To the Gentiles. Okay, now let's look at Acts 28, verse 28. The last chapter in the book of Acts, the, the end, right? The end of the book. By the way, you can pretty much tell what a book's about by reading the introduction and the ending, can't you? Right? I mean, that's how you do it. So you look at the book of Acts and look at the beginning and you see disciples going to a kingdom and then you look at Acts 28 and Paul's going, that's it. The kingdom's not going to you anymore. That, what's the book about? And well, they 
had it up here. They didn't have it over here. It's about the decline of Israel, the rejection of the kingdom by Israel. Acts 28, verse 28. He's in Rome now. So he's in Antioch in Acts 13. He's in Corinth in chapter 18. And now he's in Rome in chapter 28. And he gets some Jews together who want to hear him. And, of course, they reject him again. They reject the message of Jesus was the Christ, and they reject the gospel of the grace of God. And Acts 28, 28, Be it known therefore unto you that salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Okay, so it's not that he's turning or that he will go. Now it is sent to the Gentiles. And look where he's at, by the way. Rome. Okay. Rome is not where Israel should be, you see. That's where Paul is at. He goes, I'm here already. I'm amongst the Gentiles. You know, you're done. You've rejected it. Okay, so that's the end of the book. End of story. Israel's decline is complete. Okay? No more does Paul go to synagogues and teach his kinsmen in the flesh, though he has a heart for them in Romans 9. Okay, so this is the story of the book of Acts. Right? Now, most people teach the book of Acts as if, and like Pentecostals do, that the church begins. The Acts is the story of the beginning of the church. Right? And so this is how we ought to, ought to behave. And so they say Acts 1 and 2 is the beginning of the church. That's our example. And from there, the gospel just increases. Right? But don't, didn't we just see a different picture here? That everywhere in the book of Acts, Israel rejected the gospel, rejected the gospel. Okay. And they point to Paul, by the way, as their prominent missionary of why the gospel increased. Well, yeah, the gospel increased with Paul among the Gentiles. Right? But the Jews kept rejecting. We just saw three places there, that progression of events. Okay. But Pentecostals, along with the majority of Christianity, think that the book of Acts is about the rise of the church. When it's about the fall of Israel. And so they begin their doctrine, their thinking, with Acts chapter 2, the teaching of Pentecost, and say that's where the church began. Okay. And that's foundational to understand Pentecostalism. Right? Because that's where our belief systems differ. We call ourselves mid-Acts. We call ourselves mid-Acts because we take our example from Paul when, our, when the church, the body of Christ, started today, which happened to be in the middle of the book of Acts chronologi chronologically. We make that statement, not just because that's what we like to be called, but because there's an issue out there that we need to be aware of, that people start their church in Acts chapter 2. It's called Acts 2 dispensationalism. Okay, We're mid-Acts dispensationalists. See the difference? Now, all Acts 2 believers, all people who think the church started here, are not Pentecostals. Okay. The majority of Christianity thinks the church started in Acts 2, and not all of Christianity are Pentecostals. Right? But all Pentecostals are Acts 2. Do you see the difference? Okay. Every Pentecostal, their, their whole system is right here in Acts chapter 2. That's their statement of faith right there. Uh, Pentecostals are identified by their claim to the supernatural power in Acts 2. I jokingly said before, if we take the supernatural powers away from Pentecostals, they're no, no different than the Methodists and the Wesleyans. And I have, I have a historical reason to say that, by the way. The Pentecostal teaching in that group of people came from the Methodists and the Wesleyans. If you don't know the, the church history in America in the, in the 18th century, you know, the Civil War and all that, John Wesley and Peter Carwright and those guys were Methodist preachers. And back in the early 1800s, okay, Methodism was the new thing. That was the thing to be. These were the guys going to the backwoods, and they're the ones that are calling on the, uh, the frontier of America, you know, the West, which was Indiana at the time. You know, and, and they're, they're proclaiming the gospel, and then people are getting saved by droves. Right? So Methodism was on the rise. But eventually, you know, when groups get really big, you know, it tends to get a little more bureaucratic, a little more dry, right? And so towards the end of 18th, or the 19th century, you get Methodists getting a lot more structure, a lot more denominational control, okay? And so there wasn't as much freedom down below. And so there was a, a, a rabble of Methodists who said, we don't like this. What happened to the good old days of John Wesley, right? And so what happens to them? They break off of the Methodists and form the Wesleyans, okay? And early in the life of the Wesleyans, they were the ones hooping and hollering, saying, we're John Wesley, we've got the spirit. We're... We're the Wesleyans. And so they were really big at the end of the 19th century, or coming into the 20th century with the Nazarenes. Okay. Well, eventually, in the early 20th century, there were people who broke off the Wesleyans and took John Wesley's doctrine of second blessing, sanctification, and baptism by the Spirit, okay, and decided to bring back all the supernatural powers next to, and they claimed to be Pentecostals. That's how it all began, you see. So historically, that's where they placed themselves. But doctrinally speaking, okay, we're not one to worship history. Doctrinally speaking, they put themselves right here in Acts 2. We follow? We're all on the same page? That's where, that's where they're coming from. And so what they teach is going back to Pentecost. Now, what we're going to try to point out today is that when you go back to Pentecost, nothing new is there. 
Okay. Majority of people think the church begins here at Pentecost, but what's new at Pentecost? On your outline, nothing. There's nothing new here. Okay. Everything that happened in Acts 2 was prophesied or taught or happened before. Okay. Which should tell us something. This is a continuation of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we covered last week, Jesus' earthly ministry, which was going into the prophesied kingdom to Israel. Okay. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. Here is the beginning of the book of Acts. Okay, This is post-resurrection. Uh, this is where Jesus is teaching them about the kingdom of God. Up in verse 3, it says for 40 days he's been speaking to them pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that's 40 days after his resurrection. So even after Jesus resurrects, he's not telling them the meaning of the cross. He's telling them that I had to do this. Look at the prophets. Now let's go into the kingdom. Okay. The disciples even ask him, will you at this time in verse 6 restore again the kingdom to Israel? Okay. They ask him, where well, are you going to restore the kingdom now? Because that's what the prophet said would happen. And Jesus doesn't deny them. He doesn't say, no, 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 you missed the point. He says, you, it's not for you to know the time. Okay? You just settle down, children. It's not for you to know. Okay? It's, 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 in, the God, it's in God's mind when it's going to happen. But he says you're going to receive some power in verse 8. Now, down in verse 15, which is where I wanted to go, here we see a definition of this group that, uh, that starts the book of Acts. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, and Peter is the de facto leader of the group. Okay, he's not given a special position as a pope or anything, but he's the speaker of the group by, just by reason of his, uh, his leadership. Okay, if you look in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Acts, he stands up and does this. He's one of the three closest to, to Jesus and all of this. So verse 15, he stands up in the midst of the disciples and says, The number of names uh, together were about 120. Men and brethren, uh, this must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by concerning David had spake. And he's going to present to them the choosing of the twelfth man. Remember, at this point, there's only 11 of them because the 12th guy, Judas, killed himself. He's the one that betrayed the Lord, right? So there were 12 initially. One guy dropped off. And so here he's saying, we need to choose a 12th man. Because, by the way, it's necessary, as he just said, it must needs be fulfilled. As the prophet said, we need 12. Okay? Which should tell you right there that it's prophetically significant. Okay? What does 12 mean in, your, in the Bible? Well, you have 12 tribes of Israel, Right? How many tribes of the Gentiles do you got? Not 12. Not lots of them. Okay, there are no tribes. Of the, I mean, there's just nations out there. There's the rest of them. The, the Gentiles, the word means nations. So God made a separation back here in time past between Israel and the other nations or Gentiles. There was a separation here, and that separation was the law. Separated Israel from the Gentiles. Acts one fifteen. then, Peter says, we need a twelfth man to lead the twelfth tribe of Israel to go into the kingdom where we'll sit on a throne on twelve thrones uh, with, with, on a city with twelve gates that twelve tribes are going to come to with twelve fruits hanging from the trees and twelve, twelve, twelve. You see the significance there. Okay, but watch Perry Stone, a Pentecostal today, teaching on uh, television. He, go, he likes to go back to prophecy and speak about a lot of these significance of the numbers and all of this, right? And uh, like I said, Pentecostals are biblically oriented. So they speak a lot about prophecy. They know the significance of this, th this stuff. Uh, they know the number 12 in Israel and how it relates to prophecy and all of this. And the river of life and how it relates to prophecy. Okay, which is why, by the way, as a side note, a lot of Pentecostals have a, a very Jewish bent to them sometimes. Okay, not always, but sometimes they've got a Jewish bent. Because they're going back to, Pen to Pentecost, which by necessity sends them back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the Old Testament and all the prophets. And if they're Israel... If they're going into a city with 12 literal gates and they got the, the names of the tribes on it, then maybe you and I are part of the hidden tribes, right? Maybe you and I are part of Israel. So see, all of these strange doctrines come from this right here. This is the starting point. Anyway, back to the verse here. Acts 115 says that there are about 120 people here with Peter. Okay, now these 120 people, where did they come from? They came from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They came from Jesus' earthly ministry. The 12 apostles were chosen back here. You can't separate... Acts 2 from this, from Jesus' earthly ministry. You can't do it. They're connected. The only difference is Jesus is gone now. Okay? And he tells them what to do. He says in John 17, we'll get there on Tuesday in a, in a few months. In John 17, I send you as my Father sent me. In John 17. So as Jesus came in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to teach about the kingdom, and we covered last week about uh, the law and all of that, his disciples were preaching the same thing. The kingdom, the law, right? The Messiah. And all of that. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says here, 
after Peter preaches his Pentecostal message. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Wow, what a meeting. 3,000 souls. What they don't tell you is in an asterisk there is that this is at the Jewish festival of Pentecost. Every Jew was there. 3,000, small number. Okay. When you're at Pentecost, you're surrounded by a million Jews. 3,000 based on a million, you know, <laughs> that's a pretty small percentage. You know, and Peter's there speaking to the whole crowd. So you got 3,000, yeah, good day, I suppose. But the majority rejected him. Okay, that, that's where you get from that. But they, look, it says there they were added to the group. Okay, so just a real simple English uh, understanding there of the verse will help you understand that whatever happened to Pentecost was an, in addition to this group that has already started back here, the 120 in Acts 115. Look at Acts 1 again, back up at chapter, verse 21. People think the church began at Pentecost, right? And Peter started the church at Pentecost. But look at Acts chapter 1, verse 21. Uh, we're back in the context where Peter's choosing that 12th man, right? And he's laid out some qualifications for this 12th man. They can't just randomly choose a guy. He's got to meet certain conditions. Like I mentioned previously, there's, uh, there's conditions that the 12 apostles had to meet. Uh, Paul was not subject to any of those, but Acts chapter 1, verse 21 says, Where, Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Condition number one, the twelfth man has to be someone that was with us when Jesus was in and out from among us. He can't be some stranger like Paul, by the way, which isn't even saved yet. But Saul did not meet this condition. Saul did not hang around with the twelve apostles in Jesus' earthly ministry. Could not be the twelfth man. Okay. Uh, so you had to be with them in verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us. So what does Peter say in Acts 122? The beginning is John's baptism. So Peter is saying that the beginning in Acts 1 is not Acts 1. It's Matthew 3. It's Mark 1. It's Luke 1. Right. It's back with John the Baptist. And so, again, you see the connection here between Pentecost and John the Baptist. It's just all a slippery slope from there, folks. Because we covered last week a little bit about John the Baptist and how Malachi predicted John the Baptist. And Isaiah 4 predicted John the Baptist. And the, the, the gospel that John the Baptist preached was, was just exactly what the prophets and the law said that he should preach. Okay? So if you think the church started in Acts 2, you're going to be connected to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the Old Testament law and the covenants, and it's a slippery slope. You become Israel, and now you're following the law for salvation. You're thinking you're going into a kingdom because all that's tied into this. You see how, how I, why I say there's nothing new in Acts 2? Right? There's nothing new there. It's a continuation. It's a fulfillment of this back here. And yeah, some exciting things are happening, like the Holy Spirit coming and this sort of thing, which hasn't happened before. But it was a fulfillment of what they've been speaking about since the world began. Okay? It wasn't as if something secret happened, which is the key word when it comes to <clears throat> comparing Peter and Paul. <clears throat> Look at uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 16. If John the Baptist was the beginning, we know one thing for sure, that the beginning that Peter references in Acts 1 uh, was not the beginning of something entirely new. It was the beginning of the end. Okay, Even with John the Baptist, it wasn't something totally brand new. What was happening with John the Baptist was that the end is here. Welcome to the end. You know, the beginning of the end. You've heard that phrase. So John the Baptist is preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand. Mark 1.14, Jesus himself preached. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is the end game, folks. That's game over. Kingdom. Jesus is on earth reigning as king. Okay, no more church fights, nothing like that. Christ is going to take care of it. You know, that's the end. So the beginning of the end was John the Baptist. Matthew 24, Jesus himself preaches the end. When he says these signs will come before the great notable day of the Lord. You know, great earthquakes and this and that. You know, and he presents the signs of the times. Right? You see, that's all end times, the last days. And so the beginning that Peter references in John the Baptist was the beginning of the end. Get that? Okay. What was going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at Pentecost was that the end was nigh. Okay. They're looking for the end, which is why, by the way, I help you understand a little bit better, why God told them to sell everything they had. Why would God do that? Does he just want all their money? You know? I mean, he told them to sell everything they had because they don't need it going into the kingdom. Okay. It was going to happen right there. Now we're looking back 2,000 years going, well, that didn't happen. Which everybody sees that. And what's our answer for it? Well, it's because Christ interrupted it. He postponed his wrath with something else. Okay, But you don't understand that if you think it happened in Acts 2. You're, think, you're thinking you're going to the kingdom just like these guys. 
and you're waiting patiently for the kingdom and it's still not happening 2,000 years later. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. Verse uh, 16 and 17. Peter here says uh, about their tongue speaking. This is where the Holy Ghost has been poured out upon them by the Lord Jesus. The baptism uh, with the Holy Ghost that Matthew 3 spoke about and that uh, Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 spoke about. And in Acts 2.16, Peter explains to the people listening that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come, pa- come to pass in the last days. Acts 2 says this is the last days in Acts 2. That's not something that you say if you're starting a church that goes on for 2,000 years. Hmm? Right? If this is the beginning of a church that goes on for 2,000 years, you're not going, this is the beginning of something new. Right? No, no. He says this is the last days. Game over. Prophets are being fulfilled. You better get on board or face God's wrath. That's what he's preaching. And he even adds to that, the Messiah came. You killed him. Bad news for you. You better repent. Right? See, so they're already behind. Acts 2, 16 and 17, he makes the point that this is he's preaching about and what's happening here is what Joel spoke about. And it's the last days. It says in Joel chapter 2, 28, which he quotes in Acts 2, 16, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and dreams and all of this. Down in verse 19, there's going to be wonders in the heavens. Moon turns to blood. The sun turns dark. That's Joel 2, 28. You can go back and read it in the prophets. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 24. Okay, again, nothing new is happening here, you see. He's just preaching what prophecy taught. He's preaching what Jesus taught. Same message. Now they've got power from the Holy Ghost to preach it. You see how that works? This, by the way, this Holy Ghost empowerment is something that never happened before, though it was foretold. Okay, it, when you get to the end, things like that are going to happen. You know, some things that never happened before because it's the end. The Holy Ghost comes, and the Holy Ghost even was not some brand new thing. It's not as if the Holy Ghost is here, now we're starting a church for 2,000 years. The Holy Ghost was a sign of the end times, as he points out in Joel 2.28. The Holy Ghost came as a result of Ezekiel 36.27. For back in Ezekiel 36, God had prophesied to Israel hundreds of years earlier that he would give them a new testament because the old one wasn't working well for them. You know, because they kept disobeying it and were cursed constantly. In Ezekiel 36, he says, I'll give you a new covenant and I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Let me turn there so I don't misquote it. Ezekiel 36, verse 27. <clears throat> I, will call, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. You see, so that's Acts chapter 2 right there. The new covenant, the way that it's different from the old one, we've studied this over and over again. The old covenant was the law just given to people and they failed to do it, right? They failed to live up to God's righteousness as we continue to do today. The new covenant says that you're going to follow the law and I'm going to help you do it by giving you my spirit and causing you to do it. Okay, so if they're they're empowered by the spirit and the spirit causes them to obey the law and they have a new heart and all of this, it's not going to be that difficult for them to do. They can actually do it with God's help, you see. Now, the problem with that is when people say that the church began at Pentecost in Acts 2 and they claim to be filled with the Spirit, right? they're claiming that the Spirit is causing them to walk in my statutes, Ezekiel 36, 27. Don't see that very much. Okay? Pentecostal people, as much as they claim, are very similar to other people in the way they behave, okay? which is pretty much you know, like normal humans. It's hard in your flesh to battle your flesh and you make mistakes sometimes and you sin. Right. And of course, as Christians, we understand we shouldn't sin, you know, and we're we're and we're uh, treated by God by his grace in Romans six and all of this. Uh, but first John three says these people here could not sin. The spirit's causing them to obey. Right. Um, which is how they're going to get into the kingdom, by the way, seek the kingdom and his righteousness. So that's Ezekiel 36, Luke 24, 49. Jesus tells his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until you're imbued with power from on high. Luke 24, 49. So again, the serious Bible student would ask, why did he say Jerusalem? And what is this power he's talking about? Well, Ezekiel 36 is the power he's talking about. And Jerusalem because it was given to Israel. The new covenant is given to Israel. It's not given to the Gentiles. Luke 24, 40, 49. Behold, I send by the promise of my father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. That's what they did. Okay. Now imagine, just for a second here, again, we're, we're trying to talk about Pentecostalism today, but imagine that you are not a Pentecostal, and imagine that you do not understand Paul's special revelation. I know this is going to be hard for you, but at once you were like this, right? 
and you're trying to follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, trying to follow Christ's example, and here comes a Pentecostal up to you, and he shows you Luke 24, 49. Wait in Jerusalem until you endure with power from on high, the promise of the Father. And then he shows you John 14, 26, where Jesus himself says, I'll send you the Comforter, and he'll give you all knowledge. In John 15, 26, you know, and he'll help you remember all things. And in 1 John chapter 2, where it says you'll have an anointing, and you won't have any man need to teach you. Okay, These are verses in your New Testament. What do you do with yourself? Big question mark, you know, that's what you do with yourself, you don't know what to do. Okay, which is why the church at large, because they don't understand Paul's special revelation, they don't know how to study their Bible, number one, but they don't understand right division, number two, uh, they don't know what to do with Pentecostals. They have no answer to them, you see. The Pentecostals have verses to back up what they're doing. And the majority of Christianity says, those verses don't count today. That's a bad answer, okay? Now, that's not what we're coming to the table with today. We're coming to the table with God started something new in Acts 9. Which means if you're in Acts 2, that's old news. You need to get up to speed. <laughs> you don't hear that much. Normally it's the Pentecostals saying, we got a new revelation, a fresh revelation. You know, and the normal church is going, no, 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 no. We don't need the new revelation. I, we need the new revelation. Look at Paul. Okay, Pentecostals don't know that one. What happened? They missed out this fresh revelation of the Lord? You see? So th there's something they missed. And that, that's what gives you a different advantage than, than the other Christians out there when talking about Pentecostals. Uh, and again, we don't do this with an argumentative spirit, right? I'm teaching you because we understand this already, and it's, we need to understand the distinction clearly. But uh, these people are trapped in this system because they don't under, it's, it's a lack of knowledge is all it is. They don't understand. Okay, It's just information. If we give them the information, they can study for themselves, and they can free themselves from the system right here that puts them back under the law. Okay, So again, where are we at here? We're looking at uh, in Acts. <clears throat> Pentecostalism is tied by definition to Acts chapter 2, okay? which means their belief system is that the church started in Acts 2, and they claim that this is the new, beginning of something new. Now, we've just covered five or six different verses here that proves that that's not new. Okay? That, that's, that was what was prophesied previously. Uh, that was a fulfillment of old things, and uh, that's just a continuation of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And how easy is it for us to show from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that the disciples didn't even know what the cross meant? Why, there's a whole list of them on the website now. Okay, see, so that's a slippery slope into a place of ignorance if you think that Acts chapter 2 is where the church began. Uh, but let's look at some doctrines here, apart from just saying, well, that's a false doctrine there. The church didn't start there. Let's look at some other things that are more detrimental, more dangerous uh, to someone's soul, like salvation, for example. Okay, keeping salvation according to the Pentecostal. Now, I've got a copy here of the statement of faith from the Church of God in Christ. Uh, the Church of God in Christ is the largest Pentecostal denomination in America, okay, with over 5 million people uh, in, in this denomination. Uh, it's the largest American Pentecostal denomination. And under their statement of faith for salvation, I'm going to read to you what it says. Now, keep in mind here, I'm going to remind you of what salvation is in case you've forgotten. Right? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? his payment for your sins and you put your trust in what he did, then you're off the table. There's nothing you need to do. He paid for your sins, and in, uh, in reconciliation, you get his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Right? So that's the gospel that gives you eternal life. Okay? You and yourself are not just to get eternal life. It's just that Christ died on your behalf. Okay? But listen to this for salvation. This is what their statement of faith is. Salvation deals with the application of the work of the redemption to the sinner with his restoration to divine favor and communion with God. This redemptive operation of the Holy Ghost upon sinners is brought about by repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, which brings conversion, faith, justification, regeneration, sanctification, and baptism of the Holy Ghost. Repentance is the work of God, which results in a change of certain conviction wrought in the heart of the Holy Spirit as to the truth of the gospel uh, and, her, and heart trust in the promises of God in Christ. Conversion is that act of God whereby he causes the regenerated sinner in his conscious life to turn to him in repentance and faith. Regeneration is that act of God by which the principle of the new life is implanted in a man and the governing disposition of soul is made holy and the first holy exercise of this new disp disposition is secured. Sanctification is that gracious and continuous operation of the Holy Ghost by which he delivers the justified sinner from the pollution of sin, renews his whole nature in the image of God and enables him to, to perform good works. Wow, that came straight from a seminary, didn't it? A lot of big $10 words in there. Did you hear anything about the blood, the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection? No. No, no, not at all. This is their statement of faith under salvation. 
nothing in there about the blood, death, burial, and resurrection. Now, I'm not saying that everyone in the church of God in Christ is not saved, because there are probably people there that understand the cross, right? But their statement of faith has nothing to do with the cross. That's interesting. They just explain what salvation was, and it's the redemptive work of the Holy Ghost upon the heart of man, and their faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't explain what your faith was. It was in Jesus Christ, just in Jesus Christ. That's the same language, by the way, we're studying on Tuesdays, that Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the, the 12 apostles. They say faith in Jesus Christ and repentance and following the law, right? By the way, we mentioned on Tuesday, I know, I think it was Tuesday I was mentioning this. Okay, it's not enough ever to just have faith in Jesus Christ, okay? The, 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 just to believe that Jesus Christ is God, that's never enough, okay, in any dispensation. But remember the devils in James 2? The devils know that he's God. Okay. The difference in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was that the, the, the people who wanted to follow Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or this system, had to believe that he was God and follow the law. Okay. And, of course, in the New Covenant, the Spirit would be poured out and they would walk in the law naturally. Right? But that was always added to the belief that Jesus was God. You can't just believe Jesus is God. That's a fact. It's just a fact. It's like the pews are red. How does that do anything to help you get saved? Okay. Jesus Christ is God, plus you need to follow the law because someone's going to justify you, right? And under the law system, it's you, you see? Under the grace system, who justifies you? Jesus Christ. How did he do it? By the work that he did. So in this dispensation, you're not doing anything. You're not following the law for salvation, but that's because the work has been done. You're not just believing Jesus Christ is God. You're believing that Jesus was God and he died on the cross and paid for your sins, you see? So you're believing faith that Jesus was, was God and that the work was already done, right? And so it's not enough just to believe in Jesus Christ, okay? Half the world believes in Jesus Christ, Christians and non-Christian. But that's all over the statement of faith. Did you hear it? Faith in Jesus Christ and repentance. Faith in Jesus Christ and repentance and repentance and repent and faith in Jesus Christ and repentance. Regeneration. How does all that happen? How does all that happen? They totally miss the gospel of the grace of God. Now, again, maybe you can send them an email and maybe they'll put it in there and say, oh, yeah, we forgot that part. But still, how do you, how do you forget the most important part of the gospel? You see? So, again, we're not in the position to judge whether people are saved or not. That's God's position. We're not here to say you're saved, you're not. But when people, when you ask someone about salvation or someone says this is how you're saved and they list something and you don't hear in there the gospel, what are you to think? Uh, maybe he forgot. Hope he knows, you know. You can only conclude that he either doesn't know or doesn't think it's that important, right? I mean, why wouldn't he put in there? Uh, so anyway, back to the topic at hand. Salvation to the Pentecostal, just like their behavior with supernatural powers, is going to be tied directly to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and that message, that gospel of the kingdom that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John taught. And again, we know, as those who rightly divide it, the gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the kingdom is the kingdom's here, good news, Christ is coming back, right? Nothing to do with the cross. The apostles taught the gospel of the kingdom without knowing the cross. But the gospel of the grace of God is centered around the cross of Jesus Christ. Because that's how God could give you his grace. Christ paid it all. Right? That's, that's grace. You don't have to do anything. So when you're talking about salvation to a Pentecostal, you need to understand you're dealing with a person. And you need to, to see what they know individually. But you're dealing with a person who's stuck in a denominational setting who tells you that the gospel for you to believe for salvation is the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, and that's dangerous, you see. Okay, one of the things on, on the cards that people hand out, on the Back Grace Ambassadors cards, it says things that churches will not tell you. Right? One of the things that churches will not tell you is that the most dangerous things to your soul are found in churches. They're dangerous places. You can go in a church, and if you're in the wrong church, they will tell you the wrong thing, and you'll believe it. That's dangerous. You might as well just stay outside until we come and get you. Right? You see, so... <laughs> But you see how it is. I say that jokingly. But, you know, you need to be fully persuaded in your own mind based on the scripture. Okay, churches are dangerous places. Right? If the devil in 2 Corinthians 11 transforms himself into an angel of light and a minister of righteousness, where is he going to be? In a church. Somewhere. Okay? So you're walking right into the battle when you go into a church. You need to be equipped. You need to know where to find the truth right here. And so one of the things on our website, our new website we put up, is that when you come here, we point out that you have our final authority sitting on your lap, the Word of God. And so don't believe what the pastor says just because I said it. Look at the Bible. And if I don't say what's in here, rightly divided, throw me out. You say, go somewhere else. Go with your feet. Whatever you need to do. 
Because you're in a battle for your soul, you see. And you need to be assured in yourself about, it, about, its, uh, about its destiny, about what it's being taken care of. Which, by the way, has to do with Pentecostalism here. We'll see here in a second. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Since Pentecostals, uh, their belief system is tied to Acts 2, it's going to be tied, like most Christians, to the 12 apostles, Peter, James, and John. And because of that, uh, the writings of these folks have a little higher position. Uh, so when you turn to Peter, James, and John and their writings, uh, they're going to look to them first over Paul, which is a sad thing. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Here, John writes, Whoso keepeth his word... In him, verily, is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Okay, it says in verse 3, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Right? And so if you're in 1 John 2, 3, 4, and 5, how do you know if your love is perfected? How do you know if you're in God, if you're in Christ? Well, you're keeping the commandments, right? You're uh, walking the way Jesus walked. So you get the bracelets that say, what would Jesus do, right? And where does that take you? Back here. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What would Jesus do in his earthly ministry under the law system? Keeping the commandments. And we know the verses already, Matthew 19 and Matthew 23, where Jesus himself taught the law, right? Matthew 5, 17, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, right? So if you go back here, you need to be careful because you may be under a law system and think that your good work somehow are attached to your salvation, which, by the way, if you didn't catch it, the last line on that statement of faith, the Holy Ghost uh, renews his whole nature in the image of God and enables him to perform good works. Salvation. Isn't that Ezekiel 36? Isn't that the new covenant? The Holy Ghost renewing their nature and enabling, causing them to do good works. Right? That's the new covenant. They're, in, they're teaching the exact right thing at the wrong time. They're teaching this doctrine over here. You see? That's a dispensational concept. That's why what we teach right division is so important. You can't just teach anything in the Bible. You have to know where you're at in God's program. Okay? And if you think this is the last thing that happened and you're stuck here, you haven't, you're not caught up to what's new. You haven't, you're not caught up to the revelation given to Paul. Look at Matthew 5.48. There's a teaching under Pentecostalism, and it stems from... Uh, a doctrine that John Wesley initiated, at least historically in America, in Matthew 5, 48, is this doctrine of perfection. In another way, it's, it's talked about as being second blessing sanctification. And uh, you're saved once by trusting the gospel, whatever that is, right? And then uh, the second blessing is when you've been given the Holy Ghost, you're renewed in your nature, and you're enabled to walk in the law. This enablement, according to 1 John 2, uh, keeps you walking in the commandments, and Matthew 5.48 doesn't become too hard for you then. Matthew 5.48, Jesus instructs his disciples to be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Okay? That's a tough saying, unless you believe that the Holy Ghost is going to enable you to walk in the law. Right? Look at 1 John 3. By the way, it's important to believe that the Holy Ghost is going to do this, because in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 and 10, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. First John 3, 9. See that? First, verse 10 says, The children of God are manifest, the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Your righteousness and your love of God is tied directly to your behavior in 1 John chapter 3. You see? Same way it was in Matthew chapter 5. By the way, the teaching from John Wesley about second blessing sanctification started from 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, where John Wesley taught that in the unsaved person, there's the seed of sin. Okay, and of course, it's like a metaphor and all this, right? And so in the unsaved person, there's sin. When you get saved, John Wesley taught that that seed dies and it's replaced with the, with the godly seed. And that godly seed cannot sin, according to 1 John 3, 9. And if you do, you may lose it, right? You, you rejected the seed, <laughs> Right? Uh, which is the same teaching in Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 says that if you've tasted the heavenly gift and fallen away, you know, you've lost it. Okay, so that's, that's where that came from. The Pentecostals picked up on that, by the way, and that's incorporated into their belief about salvation and how the believer is regenerated and enabled to walk righteously. Right? 
And of course, they say this not in a way as we do under grace or the Holy Spirit uh, is, is that conviction within us, but they teach it as if they're walking without sin. Okay, Pentecostals have told me before that, yeah, I can go days without sinning. Right? And then when they do eventually, you know, you're asking, well, what do they do when they sin? Well, they confess their sins, First John 1, 9. And then Christ, God is just to forgive them of their sins. Right? We've already covered before First John 1, 9 in confession. We covered that last week right, with the emailed question. Why would you confess your sins if Christ has already paid for them all? Right? But they don't understand that in their belief system. They don't, they, don't, they don't grasp that. It's all about their works and their behavior. So they've got to confess. And so they teach this doctrine, some of them, a sinless perfection. Uh, not everyone believes in the sinless perfection, but they do understand the Holy Ghost enablement of the new covenant. Right? And, of course, that's tied to James chapter 2. And so they wholeheartedly approach James 2 and say, there's no problem with this. Faith plus works. James 2, justified not by faith only, but by works. Yeah, that's what Jesus taught. So Pentecostals, their eyes are open a little bit because they see that James 2 is exactly what, the, what Jesus taught. Faith plus the wall. Faith plus commandment keeping. Then there are other Christians who are in denial, right? The non-Pentecostals who don't really divide. They're in denial saying, well, James 2 doesn't teach the law for salvation. That can't be because they're confused by Paul. Right? Paul says, you're not under the law. Uh, so they're in a tizzy there. And, of course, uh, the Pentecostals, uh, you need to understand uh, when you attach faith works, when you attach the law to a faith, when you attach something to nothing, it equals something, Right? If you believe that you don't have to do anything for salvation, but you need to do this, the end result is you've got to do something for salvation, right? Uh, the, one of the questions last week was, you know, what about a church that uh, believes that you have to be baptized, but baptism is not for salvation? Well, okay, so you don't believe anything is needed on, on, by you for salvation, but you have to be baptized. What does that mean? You have to be baptized for salvation. You can't get around that, Okay. You're teaching a works-based salvation, which is what most Christianity does. Uh, I bring that up just because people will quote to you Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Yeah, we believe Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's not by works that you're saved. It's by grace only. But we also believe, Matthew 3, you need to be baptized to be saved. And you have to repent, according to Acts chapter 2. Right? And you have to follow the commandments, according to 1 John 3. You just added a bunch of stuff to the gospel, which corrupted it. You see? That corrupted the gospel. If, you're, if you believe everything that came out of your mouth, I don't know if you're saved or not. The gospel is no works. Nothing. Can't add nothing else. Okay? Because you're trusting Christ's work, you say. Anything else discredits what Christ did. Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, it's like you're, um, you're rejecting the cross of Christ. Okay? In Galatians chapter 2, if you add anything to the gospel of the grace of God. So this is where Pentecostals are at. They're in a situation where they've got to add all these things, according to the verses that they're reading, to salvation. And so by necessity, they have to reject Paul's writings. Look at Luke chapter 21. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke 21. Because they're under a system in Acts chapter 2 where Peter preaches, they're going into the kingdom. And of course, that's tied to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where Jesus says the end is here. This is the last days. We're going to the kingdom. Okay, Pentecostals are constantly looking for the, the, the last days fulfillment, the last days revelation. Okay, we'll talk about this a little bit next week, but this, this is where you get all of the nutcases, okay? Because a lot of the non-Christians and even some Christians will mock Pentecostals as Christianity, right? Because they're making all of these claims about the last days. And these are the guys with the sandwich boards, right? The end is here. You know, these are the guys that said, oh, do you see that? You know, the taxes went up. You know, this is the end. You know, we're going down. You know, this is one of the signs of the times. You know, th that's who those folks are. Okay. And, and if you haven't noticed yet, by the way, I mentioned before that not all Acts 2 people are Pentecostals, right? There are churches out there who teach Acts 2 but don't claim supernatural powers and all of this, what's that make them, right? That makes them, you know, deceptive. That makes them uh, disingenuous, right? Because they're in Acts 2, but they're not doing what Acts 2 says. So you believe Acts 2 is where the church started, and you believe this doctrine's for you, but you're not selling everything you have, and you don't think this is the last days, and you're not practicing supernatural powers and gifts and abilities. Who are you? <laughs> you know, why are you just throwing out verses from the Bible? Okay, so you've got to give the Pentecostals a little bit of credit. At least they claim the verses that are written on the page. But it's a mockery to Christianity because they're claiming verses that are not to you today. You see? So they're so close to the truth, but they're entirely wrong. Can you get that? Isn't that, isn't that wild? Uh, look at, where am I at? Luke chapter 21. 
if you're under the Pentecostal system and you're waiting for the kingdom, okay, the gospel that Jesus taught in his 12, the 12 apostles was that salvation exists in the kingdom. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Good news, kingdom is here. When you reach it, peace on earth, salvation, good times, right? Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Uh, Jesus taught that it's better for you to cut off your hand if it causes you to sin so that you can go into the kingdom. Because what happens if you sin under this gospel? You're done, right? So your eye is going to cause you to sin. Pluck it out. Better to go into the kingdom with one eye than to go into hell with two. That's what Jesus taught, right? Why did he say that? Well, because it's a works-based system, right? There were early church fathers, by the way. They actually practiced that. Kind of missing something upstairs. But, you know, they sin. They say, oh, I want to go into the kingdom. They're cutting things off and everything. Don't want to go there, folks. But that's what Jesus taught, right? So the non-Christian, the unbeliever, the skeptic, they mock Christianity again because what Jesus said, he said to cut off your hand. He said to pluck out your eye. Can't take that literally, can you? Well, yeah, they did, but that's not for you today. See, this is totally a concept foreign to them, that not every verse in the Bible is directed at you. Okay? So, I mean, when you, when you understand that, your whole system of thinking has changed. But Luke 21, verse 19, I'll get there eventually. Here, Jesus teaches his disciples that the kingdom is coming. And your salvation exists in the kingdom. And he teaches them to be patient, okay, to continue in your good works, to carry your cross and keep going. Because if you fail now, if you give up now, you're not going to make it to the kingdom over there. You need to continue. And he says, Luke 21, or Luke 21, 19, in your patience, possess ye your souls. Okay, you have your soul in your hands. You have to be patient. Wait for the kingdom. Don't give up for the pleasures of this world. Right. He tells the parable of the of the seed sower. Right now, some fall upon stony ground and some of the ravens pick away and all that. But you need to be in the rich soil. You need to hold on and keep holding on. You need to be patient. That's why when you when you read first and second Peter, by the way, that's what Peter writes about all over in his first second Peter about suffering. And he says, keep going, even though you're suffering, keep going, even though you're suffering, because the kingdom, the kingdom. Luke 21, 19, in your patience, possess your souls. Look at another uh, example of him saying this in Mark 13, 13. Mark 13, he says about the end times that you're living in and all of this. The kingdom is coming. He says, you shall be hated for of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Mark 13, 13. Right. What's he doing? He's dangling the carrot, right? Salvation's over here. Endure. Continue. Be patient. That's where your soul salvation lies, getting over there. You're almost there. The kingdom of God is at hand, you see. That's, that's good news to an extent. You're running a race, you know, you're running laps, and all of a sudden you pass the, the line one time, the coach says, one more lap to go, one more lap to go. That encourages you. All right. And you keep going, you see. That's exactly what's going on here. They're in the end times, last days. Jesus says you need to endure, you need to be patient, and the end's, the end's coming up, right? Uh, by the way, what's that mean for their salvation, by the way? That it's their choice, right? That they can lose it, they can keep it. You know, it's based on their works, based on what they're doing. Nothing about the cross. Look then at Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3, a chapter after Pentecost, right? Which is where the Pentecostal system doctrinally is, exists. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Peter here is preaching his second message in the book of Acts. And he says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which is preached unto you. OK, so here in Acts 319, he's preaching repentance that your sins may be blotted out in the future. OK, that's good news, isn't it? Unless you know the gospel, of the grace of God. That Christ paid for your sins on the cross in the past, and they can be forgiven today if you trust in what he did. You see? That's better news. In Acts 3.19, the forgiveness of their sins is in a future time if they endure to the end, if they're patient to wait for it, if they're converted. Right? 1 Peter 1.13. I mentioned before that First and Second Peter is all about this endurance to the end. In 1 Peter 1.13, Peter says, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. They're waiting for a future grace, a future salvation, 1 Peter 1.13. Look one more place at Hebrews chapter 12. This is the clincher for me. I love this one. Hebrews 12. Well, it's, just a, it's such a good comparison in Hebrews 12 to this verse that we're going to see in 2 Timothy 1. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 14. The writer of Hebrews talks to the Hebrews, which Hebrews is about going to the kingdom and following the Messiah and what the Messiah did for Israel and all this. Verse 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14 is a key verse in the holiness Pentecostal system. See this, what it says right here? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. What do you got to do then? You live pretty holy. You see? Be perfect as the Lord is perfect. Hebrews 12, 14. Looking diligently, verse 15, lest any man fail of the grace of God. What is he talking about? Lest any man fail of the grace of God? I thought God's grace was what Christ did. How can you fail? Right? You can't. The grace of God he's speaking about is the grace that God gave under the new covenant. You see, God didn't have to give them a new covenant. He could have kept them under the old covenant, sent them all to hell. Right? But he gave a new covenant. And so look, I'm sending my, my, my son. And he's going to die for the sins of the old one. Hebrews 9, 15. And he's going to give, it, give you a new one. This new one's going to give you the Holy Ghost and it's going to cause you to walk in the law. It's hope for a kingdom. Right? Remember the grace in 1 Peter 1, 13 that Peter wrote about? It's future grace. Right? It's grace coming to them when they reach the kingdom. That's when they get their forgiveness. So Hebrews 12, they're pressing on. They're looking diligently. They're walking holy, lest any man fail of the grace. See, there's a grace over there. There's salvation over there. But they can stumble and lose it all. You see? So Hebrews 12, 15, the, there's a grace that fails. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator, profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Do you see the connection? Esau, Jacob and Esau, remember the story? Jacob made the, the meat and Esau sold it, sold his, his inheritance to Jacob. Okay. Could Esau get it back? No, he couldn't. He sold it. Right? These people here, they're looking for the Lord and the kingdom. Okay. They fail of grace. Can they get that back? No. They can't. Okay, just like Esau. Don't sell everything you got just because you want some temporary pleasure. Right? That's not a message, by the way, that, that reconciles very easily with Paul's gospel. Not that we can sin however we want in Paul's gospel. No, 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 no. But that you're already saved. Hebrews 12 is talking about people looking for the grace and looking for the Lord. And they're not going to see the Lord unless they're holy. Right? Well, grace says under Paul's gospel that since Christ did it all, you trust what he did, you're saved. Right? That grace doesn't fail. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Compare Hebrews 12 verse 15 when it says, Lest any man fail of the grace of God to 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 11. Here Paul says that he is appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Okay, so Paul's also waiting for a future day. But who's keeping his soul's salvation? God. Christ. He did it all. All Paul is doing is trusting that Christ did, is going to do what he said he did. Right? Christ told Paul that I paid for your sins. Romans 4 tells us that if we just believe that, we just trust it, okay, then God is able to do that which he promised. And for 2 Timothy 1, 11 and 12, you get the song, right? He's able, he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What's he committed unto him? My soul, my salvation. I got nothing to offer. That's what Paul's saying. I've committed it all to Christ, right? Hebrews 12, verse 15, who's keeping the soul? The person, lest any man fail of the grace. Right? Keep going unless you fail. You've got to keep pressing on. So Hebrews 12, uh, 20, 28 speaks about uh, people waiting for the grace and their endurance and their good works and behavior. For 2 Timothy 1, 11 and 12 addresses the fact that Paul is not bringing anything to the table. God's keeping it for me. And he's more trustworthy than me and my flesh. You see? So it, there's, there's an assurance there of salvation. Look one more place in Romans 5, 1 and 2. Paul says there that the grace that we have is not a grace that we're waiting for in the future. It's not a grace that can fail. We stand in the grace of God, Romans 5, 1 and 2, by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. 
So they're standing in it. You see, that you can't you can't move from this. God put you there. You didn't attain it. You're not climbing to this position. You're there. You're there by what Christ did, and God put you there by faith. Okay, that's a little different than Hebrews 12 and the grace that you can lose. Look one more place here in uh, Acts chapter 3:21. I'm going to wrap it up. I think we're going to cover the supernatural powers in the future. We're going to get to that again anyway, so we'll just postpone that. Acts chapter 3. I hope you're getting the idea today that what happens in Acts 2 is not a new thing in the prophetic program. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John taught it. The prophets spoke of it. And so when Peter and the apostles teach what they taught, which had nothing to do with the meaning of the cross... Right? They're teaching a law system going to the kingdom, a new covenant system, and uh, that's totally different than what was revealed to Paul later. In Acts chapter 3, verse 21, Peter says to Israel that this message that he preaches uh, was the message that has been taught since the world began. Whom He says, in, what did I tell you, verse 21? This is right after the verse we read before. The heaven must receive Christ until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord God raise up unto you of the brethren, like unto me. Him shall he ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. He shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. You see what he said? He, Peter again reiterates, Acts 3, 21 through 24 there, that what I'm telling you has been written before. It's not new stuff. All the prophets from Samuel on, Samuel's the first prophet, right, have foretold of these days. All the prophets since the world began have spoke of what's going on now. This is the end, the last days. It's being fulfilled. Verse 25 says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers. That's not you, okay? That's Israel under the covenant system, you see. So you're not children of the prophets. The prophets were all Jews, Okay, and you're not the, of the covenant people. Ephesians 2.12 says you're strangers of the covenants. Saying unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Whose seed? Abraham's seed. Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel and all that. It says in verse 26, Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And so, again, it's about Israel. And unto them first, and they get a primary position. Paul says in Romans 16, 25, that the gospel that he preaches, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, was kept secret since the world began. Yeah, that's a pretty strong distinction that what Paul preaches is not what Peter taught in Acts chapter 3. Well, if that's the case, then Paul's got something new that they didn't have back here. Okay. That information, that point, trying to show someone that, will destroy Pentecostal belief system. Because, again, like I said before, it's tied to Acts chapter 2. Right? And our, we're mid-Acts, because we understand Romans 16.25, Paul is something that was kept secret. He's got new information here. We need to follow that. That new information is going to be contrary to this information over here. 